what is data? I'm like, data is just information. And we pray constantly for wisdom. Well, what is wisdom? Wisdom is just having more information than another person. The anchoring verse that was the marker for what it is we were doing was Nehemiah chapter one, one through four. Tell me about my people and tell me about my city. So Nehemiah, they used data back then to apply to the certain people. What they did is they used sort of this macro meta data that said, hey, man, things are really messed up. And the people, they're, I mean, they're, they're jacked up. Like things are not going well. We measured prayer requests, call it crazy, but it was like, we're sitting on mounds of information that could help us steward our people. So Nehemiah, now that he got this information, what does he do? He modeled praying, he modeled fasting, he modeled mourning and he modeled weeping, but he also ended up doing something based upon the data. I'm also hopeful to have Americans working again by that Easter, that beautiful Easter day. But rest assured, every decision we make is grounded solely in the health, safety, and well-being of our citizens. Church has the one thing that most companies are absolutely desperate for, which is relationship. We own the relationship space. Like, we own it. That's the church. Regular listeners will know that the UK Digital Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee, which I advise, has been investigating fake news, what it is, where it comes from, and how big data companies are involved. But after the revelations about Cambridge Analytica, the investigation has dramatically widened. A data analytics firm that worked on the winning election campaign of Donald Trump was involved in one of Facebook's biggest ever data breaches. I'm Charles Creel. I was the special advisor to the House of Commons Select Committee in the UK that was investigating data and Facebook and Cambridge Analytica. It was really exciting for me because I'm half from Alabama and half a Kearney, so that doesn't exactly scream parliamentary advisor. This was the first real wade into this territory, especially by a, a government body or a parliamentary investigatory committee. So to be able to help drive it as the advisor was really exciting for me. Welcome to this uh, further evidence session of the Digital Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee. Dr. Krill, you'd like to start us off? Thank you very much and, mm. and thanks for having me along today. I had written an article about Cambridge Analytica uh, for a NATO Center of Excellence journal. The committee was due to go and question a number of American witnesses, including people from YouTube, Google, uh, Twitter, and Facebook. So I came in and testified. The more sophisticated operations of uh, companies like Cambridge Analytica will also use five-factor personality profiling um, on individuals and then and group those individuals and target them specifically. So it's to look for people who are vulnerable to certain types of messaging. What I'll do is I'll shoot questions to the members when we're in committee. Um, and those questions will be questions to ask the witnesses. But if someone came along and said, I, I, want to, I, want to sort of, I want to run a campaign that is, um, that is, which is going to be particularly relevant to people that are thinking of voting Republican but have very strong uh, religious beliefs, would you say we actually can create that campaign for you because we not only understand people's political motivations, but we also can identify people with uh, strong religious beliefs? Hypothetically, uh, it would be possible if you had enough data, say, on um, you know, evangelical 
uh, Christians in America to have a look at that audience and, and see if there's a correlation between that and, and some political agenda. Obviously, there are very large church organizations and religious organizations that might have access to these types of data. Yeah. Could, could you say... Um... Did you notice what Nick said at the time about evangelicals? I didn't notice at all what Nick said about evangelicals when he said it. That went unnoticed by everybody else. Why don't you tell people who you are and what it is that you do? Okay, I will. Um, first of all, if you wonder why I'm drying, drawing in the baby's room, it's the only room that we have any room in. Um, so that's the way that goes. Um, uh, my name's Charles Creel, and I'm the uh, special advisor to the UK House of Commons Select Committee on Fake News. Um, and a lot of other things, too, but that's one of many things that I do. I'm a specialist in digital media, as you can see. This is something a lot of people don't know about what brought this iteration of Cambridge Analytica down and how Alexander Nix ended up answering to Parliament. How did you do that? Um, well, Channel 4 hadn't done their sting yet. The question was, how do we get him to come in and testify? Because there was beginning to be some scrutiny on him, and we figured he probably wouldn't. So I drafted a letter that was very complimentary. Oh, Mr. Nix, you are so very, very great. It's fair to say that there'll be many people that have, have given their data to you who are not aware that their data is then being used in this way, used to support other campaigns. I think the first answer is that uh, this is not particularly intrusive data. This is not like someone's given up their health data or their financial data um, or, or their, their private data. You, you mentioned that you have four or 5,000 data points on every adult in the United States, uh, i.e. the entire voting population. Does every adult in the United States know that you have four or 5,000 data points on them? Would you please come in? And he did. What kind of people usually respond to that kind of uh, invitation? Narcissists. We're trying to make sure that voters receive messages on the issues and policies that they care most about, and we're trying to make sure that they're not bombarded with, with, with uh, irrelevant materials, and that can only be good. That can only be good for politics, it can only be good for democracy, it can be good in the wider realms of communication and advertising. How would you target millions of people like me? If you, if, uh, because, we're, because when we're talking about elections or big, big campaigns, that's effectively what we're, we're talking about. It's not just the micro-targeting of a very small number of people based on a the age or geographical location, but, but a whole range of people who hold different views. Here's what Cambridge Analytica would say. With 10 likes, I can predict your behavior better than your coworker. With 300 likes, I can predict your behavior better than your wife. But what they're really saying there is by algorithmically observing your behavior, I can learn to understand you and figure out how to push you to extremes. So if you're somebody who is politically in the middle, it's really very unlikely that I'm going to turn you into an extreme leftist. But if you were somebody who was on the left and pretty far out in the margins of the left, I can probably push you to extremism. I can get you so wound up and so angry because I know what you're afraid of or I know what pushes your buttons and I can do the same with the right. What's new is I can micro-target to scale. So I can do this to millions of people at a time now and manipulate a population to turn out to vote for the person I want them to vote for or not to turn out to vote for the person I don't want them to vote for. Can I just, can you just hold that point of Sven? I'll just yeah. get a quick... Great, great. My name is Sven Hughes. I used to work as head of politics for uh, SCL, the precursor to Cambridge Analytica. The big data is something that can be over time regulated and the commercial sector will, will kind of clean up its act. There's actually a much, much more uh, serious story that sits behind this, which is to do with election financing, the kind of companies that put into power and take out of power people on demand for a price. It's completely unregulated. Pretty much the, 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 no one knows about it. And the people who, who do know about it 
have a tendency to end up dead in Africa. With what you know, do you worry? Do you have you got scared in the process? Um, I've certainly warned one of my team, who was my deputy at the time, when I left uh, SEL for ethical reasons. I warned Dan Murashan, "Don't stay. That the, the operational security on this is not good enough. I'm pleading with you to step out of this company now with me." He made his own choice, turned around, and said no. Nope. And the next thing I heard, he was killed on an SEL. Or he died on an SEL contract in Kenya, uh, sometime late. And this is who Chris Wiley was uh, talking about being his predecessor. Yeah. So I, I was, I was in that job. Then Dan Murashan, who's dead, and then Chris Wiley, who obviously is now a household name. A deal went sour, and again, this is what. I've been told, so I'm not saying this as a matter of fact, but um, people suspected that he was poisoned in his hotel room. I also heard that um, the police got bribed to not enter the hotel room uh, for 24 hours. The period I'm interested in is 2009 to 2011 when you were working on elections in St. Kitts and Nevis, uh, Dominica, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Well, I think as I said last time, we don't generally like to talk about specific clients. I've turned down so much work. I turned down work for uh, Libya, Syria. I had someone sitting in front of me offering me a stake in a diamond mine if I put them into power, all these sort of things. You know, the, the money you can make by being unethical is so extraordinary. Disinformation is one of the biggest threats to democracy. With a committee, I really hope to make a difference for the future. Everything changed the day Chris Vickery came in and gave testimony, which is really funny because we had less people come to that testimony than any session we had done at all. Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to welcome Chris Vickery. Um, we're delighted that um, you've been able to join us, Chris, and you've come all the way from the West Coast to be here in London today. You've got hackers, and then you've got what Chris does. And hackers will break into things and take data. And they'll call the company and go, we've got your data, and if you give us so much money, then you can have your data back. Chris Vickery does something entirely different. He finds data that is exposed, and then he lets the company know, and he offers his services to help them prevent that thing in the future. So as he tells it one night, he was hammering around on the internet, and sort of listening in the background to information about the Cambridge Analytica investigation. And so he goes looking. What is happening is this database of truth exists with all the data. He finds a vast amount of cloud data open to anybody who registered for an account. The database of truth, which we started to sound a bit like a science fiction novel. <laughs> um, um, that's, is that a sort of constantly evolving organism, which is get, get sort of, you know, richer and richer, depending on what's, what's put into it? The database of truth is fed. The foundation, apparently, uh, according to what's written in there, is the Republican database called uh, Data Trust Voter Vault. There's a company named Data Trust that is very close to the Republican Party, the GOP in America, so much to the point that I would say they could be considered the same entity. And then they add state voter files to, I assume, corroborate yeah. what's in the RNC's database. Then they add consumer purchasable data, such as from Experian. You know, it's limitless what other companies would sell you data similar to Experian. Then they add lists that the, that the campaign itself gives to them. Chris finds this data, he, um downloads it, uh, he makes uh, the authorities aware of it, the FBI aware of it. On this hard drive right here that I'm you know, delivering to you guys in the committee, uh, you will find all of that. After the session was over, he gives us the hard drive and uh, me and some of the MPs are standing around looking at each other and they're, they're going like, I don't want to carry it out. And the other one's like, I don't want to carry it out either. Nobody wanted to. Nobody wanted to walk down the holes with it. It was really quite frightening. Um, so they gave it to me. 
There's a reason that not many people have come forward and spoken about Cambridge Analytica. I'm in Paddington Station and I've got this hard drive on me and I'm just terrified. I don't know what I'm doing carrying it on my back, trying to ferry it home somewhere safe and get it to people to, to examine. I was sure that there must be something on this drive that would lead us to being able to nail Cambridge Analytica. So I've just had a big interchange back and forth with They've been working with us, supposedly, for the past month on doing this hard drive investigation. And it turns out they've got one developer less than half time working on this. That's just not going to do. And what's going to happen is this investigation will end up getting lost to history. It's this alignment of very, very wealthy interests with political interests who do not have democracy at heart, who do not have people um, in their heart and in their minds, um, and, and how political systems can be manipulated. These things are aligning with one another. This story is going to be bigger than Donald Trump. It's going to be bigger than Brexit. It's been another big week in the news. The Select Committee are releasing our final report on fake news and disinformation. But really, it's about something much bigger. Look, I'm sorry if members of this committee are unhappy with the outcome of the referendum. I'm sorry if members of this committee are unhappy I, 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 with, I didn't say, with Donald I, Trump uh, being president of the United States. Cambridge Analytica is by no means alone in being a provider of immoral, irresponsible, unethical services to clandestine, hidden hands that pay big money for them. And because political parties aren't ever gonna take those people on, because they rely on them to get into power next time, they're not gonna take on the very industry that they can that can get them into power. And once they're in power, they're not gonna regulate against that industry because it got them into power in the first place. And if they turn against the industry, they'll be taken out of power. The second session was a disaster. Nix came off as a victim. It was a car crash. Yeah, the fact Mr. is, there is no what? evidence to support your position. All you're doing, doing now is you're, you're building a conspiracy. So you have this sort of Faustian game and a relationship that's going on behind closed doors, away from the public's gaze at the moment. And everyone's talking about big data. Sod big data. It's like a year and a half of work and calling Mark Zuckerberg and, 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 and pushing and pushing and, and, and writing on this report for months and it just disappears. This had been a year and a half of all of our lives, an unbelievable amount of work, people staying up all night long, months on end, doing the writing, and it just disappeared into a media black hole. It was like lying in bed in the middle of the night, have I wasted the last couple of years of my life? It just felt like everyone was going to get away with it. Yeah, there wasn't a thing I could do. What was slam dunk on the drive, though, is there was a lot of information um, from America. Uh, there were a lot of records from America um, and, and related to voting and voters. And uh, in fact, there was a part of the Republican National Committee's database on that drive. Now, the next big election coming up is 2020 election in the United States. This is Kat's phone. Please leave a message. Hey, Kat, it's me. I think we have to go to America. Whether it has to do with religion, our evangelicals are here tonight and they're all over the place. As congressional testimony over Ukraine started to heat up a few weeks ago, we learned that President Trump took time out to pray. Oh, this is God country. A group prayer in the West Wing with some high-profile guests, as tweeted by televangelist Paula White Kane. Now, a photo showed Trump standing, eyes closed, nearly two dozen well-known evangelical leaders with their heads bowed, lay hands on his arms and shoulders. Uh, what I'm trying to 
draw out is I just think we've been, this whole story has been handled in the wrong way. Um, that we're talking to the right people, but we're talking to them about the wrong things. What's happened with Trump and what's happening with Brexit is just more evidence of that. Our first stop in America was Sean Eeb with Graphica. who'd been analyzing the evidence on Chris Vickery's hard drive. I had also started looking at the United in Purpose data breach, which was the uh, 100, I believe it was 191 million voter records that were found exposed also by Chris Vickery. United in Purpose started off its life as a evangelical group. They made a coalition of pastors that were essentially doing like a get out the vote drive within their evangelical churches and stuff like that to kind of build out their voter database. By the time that Vickery found it, they had grown 191 million voter records. That's essentially every voting age adult in the U.S. Are these records the same as the GOP data trust? This is supposed to be the GOP's central location for all their data. If you look at their total number of profiles, they're pretty much neck and neck. Well, you went up by 5 million, you went up by 5 million. You're not acknowledging a connection, but it seems like you guys sure do seem to get records all at the same time. It does not seem like it makes a whole lot of sense that a evangelical group would need 191 million profiles. There aren't that many evangelicals in America. I think it's somewhere a quarter of Americans identify as evangelical, which puts you at like 75 million. Um, so there's definitely a lot of people that are in there that didn't sign up for it. Vickery also found 28 million records that were highly enriched profiles. I believe that was the one he found himself in where it had like 60 different issues and it was predicting people's stance on that issue. And for the, for the layman, what does enriched mean? So enriched, they have added in extra data saying, okay, this is a likely voter, this is a likely uh, swing voter, this person is likely to vote based on this issue. You are a kind of one position voter based on abortion. Doesn't matter what other policies you support, all those you can kind of ignore, this is the one that's important. So it's a pretty deep level of like understanding of, of what can, you know, what you can expect a person to do when they go to cast their vote. That's interesting because there's supposed to be a separation of church and state. Oh yeah, no, they're supposed to be. Um, it doesn't seem like it works all the time. <laughs> okay, he's coming. How's the sound quality? Conservative churches in America are often used to spread a number of clearly partisan political messages. They're used to mobilize and drive voter participation so when I went to meetings of the pastor networks like Watchmen on the Wall and Church United, what I saw was these national leaders who were focused on a partisan political gain. They were going around the country to swing districts often in advance of key elections and then working to shape the views of pastors and then encouraging these pastors to become politically engaged in what were clearly partisan ways. Imagine a data platform designed to help you improve the lives of individuals, the health of families, and the vitality of communities. Insights from Glue is the world's first big data platform centered around personal growth and development. It provides a 360 degree view of your audience with a privacy protected database that includes more than 2,200 data points for nearly every US consumer. Every point of data moves you one step closer to understanding the needs of your current people and those in your surrounding community, so you can reach them with the right message at the right time. That could be people battling substance use and mental health issues, or young people seeking their spiritual path. Maximize your capacity to change lives by leveraging insights from big data so you can understand the people you want to serve, reach them earlier, and turn their needs into a journey towards growth. That's outrageous. Is that on the market at the moment? They took it down. That's outrageous. Basically, they're saying, is this Cambridge Analytica by another name? God help us. We're going to hell in a handcart. God help us. So this guy, Brent, like overnight, he sends me a thousand messages from Melbourne. Hey, Brent, welcome to New York. <laughs> I wake up in the morning and my notifications are completely full.
usually because I have to deal with a lot of conspiracy theorists, one of the way that I, ways that I filter them out is if they can't be brief. So my immediate thought about Brent was, oh God, it's another conspiracy theorist. But then I started going through the evidence and it was extraordinary. When it got to the point where um, Cambridge Analytica went bankrupt, I uh, followed up on a, a kind of thought experiment really, which was go through the creditors in the, uh, in the Cambridge Analytica bankruptcy case. Now the creditor slash client, because that's the assumption that a creditor is a client, was the philanthropy roundtable that's funded by the Koch brothers. And they set up a culture of freedom initiative. They're funding projects to do with families, marriage, and church attendance. And one of the key projects that they've been promoting over the last few years is a smart ministries initiative. No matter your experience, no matter race, gender, economic status, there's just hurt, like this world hurts us. There's a world of difference between peace and freedom that only the spirit offers and relief, which we can find in a bunch of different ways. I got invited through my roommate and I was very hesitant and skeptical. It's like my brain has been rewired to see people and situations differently. To have these relationships now has changed my life. I would like to thank the Culture of Freedom Initiative. Without you, I would not be where I am. Smart ministries or, or, or data churches, or I, what does that mean, really? There's a push within what I would describe as prosperity Christianity. The uh, Culture of Freedom Initiative set up a contract with Cambridge Analytica and a church app company in Boulder, Colorado called Blue, and they set up Insights platform, which is a micro-targeting platform. And they're marketing that very aggressively to churches as a way of expanding their outreach to new worshippers to increase the size of their congregation. And um, it's also a means by which the congregation data is given. And so they discuss openly in some of the background documentation that if you target people who are suffering from relationship stress, then you're more likely to get a kind of flow on um, attendance at church and, and they're more likely to like, donate to us as much as existing church members. And so the data is the link. The concern for me is if you, if you put these techniques in a religious environment of any kind, a religious group of any kind, an audience that is ripe for information um, influence, what they are doing there is trying to um, create an unknowing universe of control in which vulnerable people are situated and this group of people who have an agenda are turning around saying, we know what's right for you, so what we'll do is create the context that when you're at your most vulnerable, we're there for you. Absolutely, without question, those are the same techniques that ISIS, Al-Qaeda, the Taliban have been using and we've been fighting for many, for many years, which is the, the parasiting, if you like, of the infrastructure of a religion to put in a malevolent message. Um, yes, absolutely, that's a concern. Sven calling it radicalization really hit home for me because a big part of my work is doing counter-radicalization um, out, out in frontline states. And these techniques are the techniques that are used in radicalization, whether you're talking about Islamic State or you're talking about neo-Nazis. We've developed and, and have built the, the, the largest data platform uh, that, that I know of in the world that's missionally aligned. The church has the one thing that most companies are absolutely desperate for, which is relationship. We lost him. The rushing source, the origin of the air, the garden gone. 
Now, ever over a distant horizon, we lost him. We chose to be without, unaware of what we had. All of us, together alone, have forgotten what we lost. My name is Gloria Beth Amadeo. I'm a writer who lives in Brooklyn, New York, um, and I was an evangelical Christian for seven years, and I was converted by Campus Crusade for Christ, which is known now as Crew. Crew's mission is to convert basically the entire world to the belief that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior and no one goes to heaven without believing in him. I was at college in New Jersey, and so I was a part of Jersey Crew like how good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. And then we have here taking the state for Christ together. I was a very vulnerable college student. My mother had a pill addiction when I was growing up and I got just super scared about being out of control, about the idea of like fraternities and sororities and of college drinking and drug culture. I walked into an office of student life Went up to a teacher and I remember, you know, just saying like, hey, I'm really scared. I don't want to be pushed into doing anything that I don't want to do. You know, other student, after I left the office, she kind of ran after me. She said, hey, so I know your concerns. I'm really sorry that you went through that and you got scared. She happened to be the president of the Campus Crusade for Christ Club. This person really became a mentor in my life. I was just trying to figure out what my life was going to look like, who I was and, and who I wanted to be. An intimate message from God to you. My child, you may not know me, but I know everything about you. All of these things that, you know, when you're vulnerable, it sounds really, it sounds really good. But what you're trained to do when you're in crew is identify those ripe apples. They knew that with me, they had an opportunity to go much deeper. When I heard Campus Crusade for Christ, I thought, oh, Christians like me, I should be able to fit in with these people. What I didn't hear at the time was evangelical Christian. Some girl, she gave me this little heart. This is the type of stuff that keeps you in it, you know, when you form these really strong bonds and, you know, you're basically told, like, I'm always here for you, I love you. In a way, getting to know them on all of these other levels before they introduced their fundamentalist beliefs made me trust them more in a sense and made the beliefs seem less extreme than I came to realize later on they were. They hook you up with a um, staff member, a crew discipler, who is somebody who does not um, go to college on campus, is above the age of 21. They're married with children and they have this like idyllic adult life. I think that that's like a part of the tactic. Seeing that makes you think, oh wow, this is possible. Once she told me Jesus loves you, nothing's gonna take God's love away, all of the warm, fuzzy stuff. After a few months, then she started saying, the act of homosexuality is a sin, abortion is murder. And if you're really gonna have this big, beautiful, wonderful life, you have to believe these things too. We had a whole women's day and had reflection questions that we had to answer. This first section is called present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Her baby, she was bouncing her baby on her lap. I remember at the time that we talked about this. When you know, you're know you married as a woman, you're supposed to submit to your husband. And we're fighting against the crew staff member with that. I was like, why would I ever have to submit to my husband? That sounds so strange. Like, do, do you submit to your husband? And she said, oh yeah, I do, but, it, but it's not so bad. It's not as bad as you think it is. Like she said, submission only means that he gets to have the final say. And what happened was my disciples, the girl who converted me, slowly started to tell me that I needed to start cutting my family out. You know, they said, your mom's not very good for you. You shouldn't talk to her on the phone anymore. So very slowly, they began isolating me away from my family. And eventually they started isolating me away from my non-believing friends as well, who they felt like had too much of an influence on my life. This tier underneath your short-term goal, what Crew's mission was, continue to target those in your life who need salvation. Yeah, the word target there sticks out to me. And Clue is a gro global organization, yes. Uh, they even are involved in the military, interestingly enough. They have a whole military chapter. If anything says the main goal here, take the state together and then take the country, is the, is the idea. Do you see any flags there about people's personal vulnerabilities or emotional vulnerability? 
I don't think that would be something that they would broadly advertise because it sounds like an e evil supervillain thing to do. So, all right, so go ahead and uh, say it again. You want me to just a little bit of my, who I am? The big question on this is why would the Koch brothers do this at all? Because they're not known for being particularly religious. Uh, so to dig into this further, um, we thought we'd start at the source and go to the founder of Communio slash Kofi. In 2014, uh, I started the Culture of Freedom Initiative at the Philanthropy Roundtable. And I had, in my public policy world, used and worked with predictive analytics and, and big data tools within public policy, to identify folks who would be persuadable on certain issues. What would it look like to use it within, within the realm of ministry? And so we, through the initiative, funded the development of the Data Insights platform. The Glue already had some initial funders, and we provided funding over time and helped to develop it and helped to test it for a few years, the multi-church test using the data with a focus on relationship ministry. Every large company in the world, if you sell consumer products of different sorts, you're trying to figure out good ways to market that. And there's no better product, really, than the gospel. Religious nuns are on the rise in America. Only these nuns are not religious at all. They check the box for none, N-O-N-E, -E, on surveys of religious affiliation. But a growing number of churches working in partnership with Communio are seeing double-digit increases in weekly membership and collections by architecting their ministry around strengthening the core building block of community, the family. Communio's playbook is now available to your church. We help a first church diagnose some, some opportunities around their church campus by identifying an audience of, say, 5,000 folks within five to 10 miles of a church's campus. Maybe have a marriage based on the consumer products data, looks like it might be struggling in some way in their marriage. They have young kids, and they're open to an invitation to church. And then we'll reach out and help them design ministry outreach invitations through Facebook, where we'll reach out to that group of 5,000 or 10,000 folks who fit that risk area and invite them in, come to a date night event at the church. Okay, with that child care provider, they'll meet people at the church and invite them over for dinner, invite them into their small group. Now these couples who didn't previously have as robust of a, their own personal network of friends are introduced to these folks who uh, want to know them. Those couples can uh, be guided over time into what we would call a growth journey. I think I read an article that you said you kind of worked with the original data guys, Cambridge Analytica, when you set it up. Is that right? We worked with a number of, of data vendors. Um, we worked with, um, uh, in my old world, in, in, uh, in public policy, there is no shortage of really good vendors. I360 is one of them. Um, uh, from an efficacy perspective, um, there's a lot of really good, a lot of good firms out there, and um, uh, we've worked with, we've worked with a number of them. And, and with funding, I mean, is it really passionate private yeah, investors? Yeah, you know, I think you've hit on something that's really central to the American experience. Tocqueville talked about it in his Democracy in America. We have this really robust tradition in our country of solving problems through voluntary civil action. The United States has the largest group of charitable donors in the world, uh, give more away in charity than any other country. So yeah, there's a lot of committed Christians who we've met with and understand that you know these resources that they have, they see them as not theirs, but God's. Is there anybody who you can mention by name? Is there anyone who want to? Yeah, n no, because uh, what we do, you know, most charities are this way. You protect the privacy of the person, largely because it's a gospel imperative. You don't want the right hand to know what the left hand is doing. I'm from Alabama. All of this stuff happens where I'm from, where I grew up, people I knew, churches I went to when I was younger. Um, it was really time for us to, you know, 
we're going to move this investigation forward to head for the Bible Belt and let it out a couple of notches. How does it feel to be in the South, Charles? Well, it feels like the promise of decent weather. <laughs> the Gansas program isn't the only one. Um, there are programs around uh, grief, around addiction recovery. Um, there's programs around divorce, programs around financial trouble. And they're all trying to draw non-religious people um, into the church. <laughs> If you feel like you're alone in your grief, be encouraged that you are not. Whatever you're facing, others have faced it too. And at a loss of a spouse event, there are people waiting to help. You'll learn what to expect in the weeks and months after your spouse's death and how to survive the loneliness. For more information, talk with your pastor or grief share leader. is the real baptism, not as a ritual baptism, which is by what? Baptism of the Holy Spirit. You see, notice the difference between the symbolism and the real thing. Now turn right. Let's go in off-road mode. We are going off-road. This is some kind of road to church. So we are heading to the Peace Lutheran Church today to uh, speak to Pastor Zantz. I've been in ministry now for 18 years. I've said this to my leaders of my congregation, the most, if you will, successful form of connecting God's love to these people in their lives has been at the moment of grief. And, um, and grief share has been a part of that. Hi, I'm Kathy Fallon, and I'm super excited to let you know that starting today, people can register for your groups online. They have a leader portal that you can get on and, and access some of their publicity materials. They have things specifically designed for bulletins and flyers, newspaper ads, the things that you can post on Facebook, little videos and so forth. Sometimes I forget Jody's gone. I knew in my head, you love God, you trust him, you pray. And that doesn't guarantee that things are gonna go well. Grief Share has been a tremendous blessing to our church. This young woman that went through uh, an amazing loss in her life, she was not a believer. Grief Share, the answers were given, and she gave our heart and life to Jesus. And they have a lot of signups I saw each month. It's, it's, it grows exponentially really fast. Yes, it does, yes. And they have new types of uh, entry uh, events. They have uh, Surviving the Holidays those who are preparing for Thanksgiving, Christmas, as you know, very difficult times. They give you tools to help you through that. And then they introduce you to the 13-week series of Grief Share mm -hmm. uh, to give you a taste of what that's like. All the skeptics in the world. A man of science, but a man of faith, and he stood in front of me, and when he would stand in front of the people and teach them the prayer, you know how he explained prayer? He says it's simply this, it's a chit-chat of God. Chit-chat of God. You know, late 90s, um, that's when the church growth movement was at its height. You know, you had the Saddleback Community Churches, you had the Willow Creeks model for outreach. There is, to some extent, an expectation or a pressure many times from the congregation to conform or to try to find outreach similar or reflective of some of the great models that came out of Saddleback and in Willow Creek. He wrestled with God about all the... For me personally, ministry has been a challenge. We're seeing in the midst of Christianity schisms left and right um, that trickles down into the congregation. The institution of church in the States is so powerful and so moneyed. Do you ever worry about exploitation, about the, the churches not being what Christianity is supposed to be? Do you see examples of that? Do I worry about it? Yeah. Every single day. Every single day. Well, David was a great guy. He had a really good church. And, um, he seemed like he was 
um, part of a big system, but not part of the machinations of it. So what we needed to do is, is move on to, uh, to a bigger church, something a little more mega. Where are we rolling out of? Montgomery, Alabama. I used to live here a long, long time ago. Not many hurries stick around that much. We're headed to Fairhope now. It's a much better part of Alabama. Is this baby happy? Yeah. Oh, is she staring out the is she staring out the sky? Yep. Catalina. Hi. Hi, I'm Mike. Nice to meet you. This is Karen. Hi, Carrie. Nice to meet you. We're so glad y'all are here. Thank you. With us today. This is our office space and uh, kind of a kind of a new space for us. Our different groups like Grief Share that meets here uh, during the week. Okay, well, that's great. So this is where we meet. We average about 13 people, but I think when we started, there's about 20, 20 25 20 people that kind of enrolled. And so sometimes they can make it, sometimes they can't. And his heart is good, and he's always kind. With the cross he proved, he is on our side. The most amazing thing about Celebrate Recovery we is the idea of a person who's been abused worshiping God in a room next to a person who was an abuser and God's honored by it. I, do, you, do, you, do you understand? <laughs> do you know what I mean? That's what God's capable of through Celebrate Recovery. That's the difference between Celebrate Recovery and most other recovery programs. So this building, this was the original building, by the way, that was built here in the year 2000. It has been a number of different things. So if we continue walking, this is our brand new space. We've been, uh, we've been here just four Sundays now. Uh, everything's state of the art, computer check-in. Type in their name and that pops all their information and they say, check in my child and it checks them in. And how big's your congregation? On Sunday morning, we we uh, typically around three thousand in total. So you've got quite a young demographic. Then. We do a lot of young families gather here with us on Sunday mornings. Uh, do you do you make specific efforts to to make that happen, or is it just we do. Yeah. we use a variety of tools to uh, to be able to uh, kind of leverage social media and modern technology with uh, with with the church. It helps us attract people. It helps us to, uh, to track teams. Um, uh, it helps us to keep track of all the, all of the kids that are here and, um, and everything, um, uh, donations. We do Facebook Live on, we were talking about that uh, on the weekend, so our services are broadcast live. More preschool space where uh, our little ones gather. Oh, this is great. This is new, a new wall that they put in to kind of give parents an idea of how much longer they have with their children. I had a lot of questions about that baby wall. I recognized it from that church's app who did this countdown to days of influence thing. So each of the, the little uh, foam things in there represents the, the weeks that you have. So as a baby, you have 936 weeks to influence your child. You know, you can be sure in that app, if you've got your push notifications on, it's uh, waking you up and reminding you, it's like, You've only got 877 days to save your child. It's a behavioral design mechanism. And then when you come over here, when your child is now a senior in high school, you only have 52 weeks left. Oh, don't make her cry. <laughs> I know. Yeah. That's really powerful. It's very powerful to me, just having yeah. done this. Yeah, it's just a reminder of, you know, the, the, top, the clock is ticking and Time is limited to, to influence your child for, for good. How will you use your time? Yeah. It's mostly software based where we can, it's, tr it's tracking. It's really, a, we're able to custom tailor it to what we do, how we track people, how we want to communicate with those people. 
the data that you have on, on the people who already come, does that mm -hmm. help you reach other people in the community? Sure, sure. When you're talking about you know a, a database of 20,000 or so people, 20,000 people know a lot, a lot of people. So, um, so it, it, it gets all over if you come to a point where, where, you, where God's in control. <laughs> You can't go two miles here without the church. I have to say, as a European, seeing how powerful and moneyed these churches are, I'm, I'm amazed. Well, Americans are big believers, and a lot of that has to do with money, too. If you're British and you are working class, it doesn't matter how much money you make in your life, you will always be working class. And if you're upper class, it doesn't matter how much money you lose or how much reputation you lose you will always be upper class. That's and true. In America, everybody's like three paychecks away from getting thrown out of their house. If you get rich, then you can go in a restaurant and flip the table over. They're gonna invite you back as so long as you can pay for the bill. And if you're poor, you're just out. So nobody in America really knows where they stand. And when you don't know where you stand, then you have to invoke systems that you can find your place in. And so Americans become real believers. There's the battleship USS Alabama, just over there. Good eating, good drinking, and damn good music. It feels good every time I get back to Alabama, and, and it feels strange at the same time. It's home, and it's not home simultaneously. I spent about half my childhood in the Deep South, and when I wasn't out traveling. I identify with the South now, even if I don't identify with Southern politics. I've been living in Europe for 30 years, although I've lost my accent. You know, when I go back home, people think I'm Canadian. At this point, my head was full. There were multiple companies that seemed to be helping people, but did they have a dark side? I needed to see Chris Vickery. With that hard drive, he brought to Parliament. He was the first person who explained how it all worked. I mean, what does the church know about you data-wise? The church doesn't need to know data-wise. The church just needs to know your name, possibly your address. Mm -hmm. Maybe your phone number, that's a good identifier too. Uh, then United in Purpose and, uh, or any other big data operation has all the data already about these different names. The data they don't necessarily have is what church you go to. That's where the link comes together. Okay. And so if they have, say, a name and a phone number, they can match it up to everything else. All your views, the websites you go to, your, your Facebook handle, your Twitter commentary, all that stuff. And they've already got a sentiment value on you. They know whether or not you're a likely uh, Trump voter or not. They just need to know what church you go to. I'm from the Bible Belt. This is my <laughs> community. You know, it touches me. This is people I went to high school with. This is people that I know. They are learning who is likely to be a drug addict, who is likely to be uh, going through a divorce because, uh, well, they don't come out and say this, but uh, those are the, the types of people that are easily manipulated. Chris Vickery made it clear that this whole thing was political. Um, the voter record leak was from United in Purpose, a company that was founded by a guy who had been convicted for embezzlement. Um, my concern, though, was on the big prize, which is the 2020 election. Could you maybe talk a little bit about how somebody would use a third-party data set for a church app, then how that can then be used politically? Well, if you can figure out that 95% of the people that are interested in thing A 
are overlapping with people that tend to join your church in your area, then you don't need to guess and target. You can target the people in your area that have trait A. If you know that this person buys these things at the grocery store, and you know that their friend, you know, Beth comes to the same church, has a kid about the same age, but you don't have her grocery store information. If you have three other friends that you do, you can pretty much guess that she buys about the same type of brands that these other ones do. So even though you only have one little spoke here, it feeds back into the main data pool of predictability. And all of a sudden you have this ability to enumerate things about Beth or you can draw it out in, in other teasing ways. But someone might say, it's just my name and my phone number. Well, for one individual, yeah, it's with one person, it's like, you know, one single grain of gunpowder, of explosive powder. And you can, you know, light that with a match and, yo, that was fun. You know, no harm done. But when you've got uh, a huge pile of it, you don't want a match to get anywhere near it because it'll kill you. They will go to a big mega church, get the pastor, preacher to give them a database of members of the church and they'll run it through their systems and figure out who's registered to vote and who isn't. And they will identify people that are registered to vote like the social conservative, Republican conservative type feelings, very anti-gay, very anti-abortion, very hard line. And they'll find one of those people and make them into a champion. And then it's up to the champion that is a registered voter to convince the non-registered congregation members that feel the same way to register to vote. So it's very selective cherry picking of, we want these certain types of religious people to register to vote and then vote. It's all there on paper, but uh, when you map it all out, it looks like one of those conspiracy boards. Conspiracies happen behind closed doors with unnamed actors attempting to deceive the public. They happen in the dark. This is happening in large part out in the open. They're using the tools of democracy to dismantle democracy. It's not really that they're trying to deceive us. It's that we're not listening. I'm always online trolling and I'm paying a lot of attention to the news. And on Chris's Twitter feed, this journalist and author pops up. Her name's Ann Nelson. And she's suddenly talking about an organization that seems connected to every aspect of this. It's the Council for National Policy, and bingo, there we are. This is a defining moment for our generation, and our people need leaders. Pastor, lead, and the people will follow. America is crying out for leaders. We see what happens when we don't elect and choose leaders. America is ailing. America is dying for the lack of leaders. Anne was about to launch her book at the Texas Book Festival, so it was back on the road again. This time I took my mother, who's a writer, Judith Richards. How is it driving in this weather? Um, if I'm aware that everyone I love is in the car. How did you come across the story? I came across it visiting my family in Oklahoma. Driving to Walmart and having the radio on and idly turning this, the, the, the tuner to a different station and coming across a fundamentalist broadcaster. The homosexual community will tell us that transformations never occur, that you cannot change. We did research on um, those who attended just one of the member ministries for at least a year. And out of those, 38% of the people who attended this large ministry no longer struggle with homosexuality. Those are success stories as well. Even if they struggle, if they continue to walk with Jesus, that's a win for the kingdom of God. At the time, I thought, well, this must be just some local outlet with this opinion. And then when I pursued it, I found out it was part of a, a network of 
100 stations. That was part of a, a trio of networks, uh, radio and then multimedia platforms. Or perhaps now is not the time for each of you denigrating God's institutions as we drive through this storm. I don't think they're God's institutions. They're man's institutions to represent God. I just kind of followed the media analysis back to the Council for National Policy, which I'd never heard of until I, I did this research two years ago. What is the Council for National Policy? The Council for National Policy is a network of organizations interested in advancing an ultra-conservative agenda. The meetings are secret. The membership is secret. The publications for the public are next to non-existent. We're here. It's all well and good to be a one-man band, but I'm no investigative journalist. I needed to understand it all, so I called in the troops to Texas. Ann Nelson has received a Livingston Award for her journalism and a Guggenheim Fellowship for her historical research. A graduate of Yale University. She's taught at Columbia University for over two decades. She's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and the New York Council on the Humanities. Uh, she's a native of Oklahoma, which we may talk about, uh, and now lives in New York City. And her book that we're here to discuss today is Shadow Network, Media, Money, and the Secret Hub of the Radical Right. The Council for National Policy, Kellyanne Conway is a member, Steve Bannon is a member, uh, and then I went through the members of Trump's Evangelical Advisory Council. About a third of the members of that council are members. The influence is quite striking. They have a social agenda, which is to roll back civil and political rights for the LGBT community, women, and others. The three components tend to be religious fundamentalists. Another part of the hub is, is the extractive industries, oil interests. And the third component are political operatives who've been trying to push the Republican Party to the right since the Nixon administration. In order to achieve this, they have to really reify the idea of the United States as a Christian nation in which their form of Christianity is dominant. It involves allowing their churches and their religious organizations to function as full-fledged partisan political activists while maintaining their tax-exempt status. June 21st, 2016, they invited a 1,000 fundamentalist leaders to New York City to meet Trump on his home ground, and they cut a deal. And the deal was pretty transparently that they would lend their ground troops, their data operations, which were very advanced, and their strategists to the Trump campaign in exchange for three vital elements. One was allowing them to fully participate in the selection of federal judges. One was an evangelical council that was dominated by members of the Council for National Policy. The religious leaders in the Council for National Policy have been become converts. Many of them were never Trumpers before June 2016. And they decided that Trump, if he was not a man of God, could be an instrument of God. They call him Cyrus after the Persian king who helped restore the Jews to Jerusalem. And Cyrus was not a man of God, he was an instrument of God. Their theorists will say outright that the American government is slated for destruction. They think that it should be destroyed. In that way, they hope to use Trump as God's wrecking ball. By the time we arrived, Brent had a surprise for us from the Council for National Policy. You hacked them? No. 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 They're just really poorly organized websites. So if I, what I did was I tried a few search terms and landed by accident on a this page doesn't exist page, and it gave me a complete archive of the structure of the website plus a search function that was for members only. And from there, you could basically map out 
their entire operation from 2015 onwards. The D. James Kennedy Center for Christian Leadership is training the next generation of leaders to stand for Christ. Uh, and for the many Christians that I bump into that say, you know, God's written off Washington, D.C., I just laugh and say, you, you ought to come and see what God's doing on this hill. It's one thing to be a Christian and feel that calling of God, but how much better if they're really equipped so that when they get, get there, people have put their faith in them, voting for them, when they get to office, they really know how to make a difference. They've concentrated on winning state houses, something that has been neglected by the Democrats, and through coordinated rewriting of laws through states that will pass restrictive laws, and if they achieve a certain percentage of the state houses with Republican governments that support their agenda, they can call a constitutional convention. There they could do a large-scale transformation of the U.S government principles. What's a constitutional convention? Oh, it's where the states get together and decide uh, how, whether and how to rewrite the U.S. Constitution. It hasn't happened for a long time. There's two ways to rewrite the U.S. Constitution, the hard way and the easy way. The hard way is that you go state by state, amendment by amendment, and nobody gets anywhere that way, especially if you want to re-engineer the entire document. The easy way, or at least the way they see it, is that you call a constitutional convention. Now, to do that, you have to get two-thirds of state legislatures to call a constitutional convention around a, at least a single issue. But once the convention has been called, then you can introduce whatever other issues you want to. So you have the opportunity to rewrite the whole thing. You can handle um, marriage equality, you can handle issues of women's rights, abortion, federal regulation, term limits. ICNP friends, Father Frank Pavone here, National Director of Priests for Life. Thank you for all your support and collaboration of us at, with us at Priests for Life for ending abortion. I have here my MAGA hat, which I'm sure that many of you have, and I wear it proudly. Many people say, oh, I've never seen a priest wearing that MAGA hat, but we're going to go forward with confidence into 2020 and re-elect the most pro-life president we've ever had. I would like to recognize some of our new members. Uh, that have joined the Board of Governors and the Gold Circle. Um, and if you're here, and I think everyone is here, if you'd please stand, we'd just simply like to recognize you and welcome you. J.P. DeGantz and his wife, Christina DeGantz. DeGantz was a member. Of course he was a member. Here's what ties everything together. But really, you know, DeGantz is just one small cog in this big machine and this big power movement that brings all these companies together. Well, thank you. My name is J.P. DeGantz, and I'm the founder and president of Communio. The initial pitch to donors from uh, John Paul DeGantz in the um, Cultural Freedom Initiative to the Philanthropy Roundtable Summit, he ran a webinar for those donors where he outlined the project. Uh, Communio is an organization, I, if I uh, pull my slides up, uh, serves churches to strengthen marriages and families at a citywide scale. And it spells out the political context within which this has been driven. It had breakdowns of the presidential elections over a series of cycles every four years running through to the 2030s. They were looking at state by state uh, what the differences in voting patterns were based on marriage, church attendance, and religious affiliation, which denomination you belong to. I get that that's very good for the church to follow its principles of outreach into the community to help people. What I'm not understanding is what's the relationship with the Republicans? In the initial pitch to donors for the, um, for the micro-targeting platform, they identified this demographic problem that there was a very strong correlation between non-church attenders and people who don't vote for Republicans. Effectively what they're saying is we can engineer a shift in the population to get that extra percentage we need of voters who can tip the balance within a particular um, electorate. My name is J.P. DeGantz and I'm the Executive Vice President of the Philanthropy Roundtable. I know many of you on today's call are joining us for the first time and aren't as familiar with this project, its goals and what it's accomplished to date. So by way of some background, 
The Culture of Freedom Initiative is a donor-led effort led by a task force of business leaders and of differing faiths from around the country. We'll go, we'll go right over into the intro of, uh, of, of Will Hild, who's our chief operating officer of the Culture of Freedom Initiative. Will and I actually met some years ago when we both worked for these uh, uh, brothers out of Wichita, Kansas, uh, the Koch brothers, and, and we uh, we're both, we jokingly call ourselves recovering political hacks. So I'm gonna skip over here to the audience builder. Right now it defaults to the entire United States. So there's 266 million uh, folks in the database. You can add the family dynamic of propensity for divorce. You can model a number of different uh, behaviors or, or tendencies towards behavior, including opioid dependence, um, different mental health disorders. He modeled praying, he modeled fasting, he modeled mourning, and he modeled weeping, but he also ended up doing something based upon the data. They're targeting extraordinarily vulnerable individuals, young struggling couples, millennials who aren't going to be able to afford a house, or they may be trying to make payments on a mortgage, or they're struggling with all the costs of medical insurance, they're struggling with a member of the family who may be having a dependency problem. So I go into my church, Yep. I fill out a survey. Yep. I trust the institution. I think it's trying to help me. I'm revealing myself emotionally through this survey. And then that information, I believe, is being anonymized for my church. Yeah. But then that information ends up going where? It goes into the database for the Insights micro-targeting platform. Also around the church, but who look like they're credit card dependent in order to pay their bills. And they can uh, basically run marketing to this custom created audience through a number of different platforms, including you know, the, the major social media uh, platforms of, of Facebook and Twitter. This was a way of um, shifting the demographic balance in key swing states in order to build up a bigger pool of potential Republican presidential voters. Looks like we're gonna be coming to Denver, uh, Fort Worth and Austin. Uh, we're beginning to work with funders in those cities. So if you're interested in learning more, just come see me. Thank you. Do people in churches know that their personal information is being gathered to use in political campaigns for the Republicans and the right? No. The churches that were actually, you know, doing a good job in the past, those churches don't necessarily realize that effectively those church leaders in some of those smaller churches are also being exploited. If you have a defense grade system, a weapon system of influence, what it is looking for is the weaknesses in people. The influence is only really necessary on the battlefield to either break the will of the enemy or to bring together the will of the, of the people who are uncommitted that you want to make committed to your cause. Every preacher we've talked to, every pastor we've talked to, I'm not even sure that they have the, uh, uh, an inkling of what's going on here in terms of what's happening with the data and the way it's speeding up the chain. What do you yeah. think the congregation would say if they realized that potentially a defense grade system of recognition of their neurosis to radicalize them in a certain way that is befitting of a political party? That is something like out of George Orwell. Where's the regulation? Where's the rules? What the strategists have done in this movement is say, all right, we don't have to win the general election. That's not the way our system works. You win the Electoral College. How do you do that? You go after the swing states. 18 million people scattered across four to six states. We know where they are. So which ones are in churches? Now we download the church directories with the support of the pastors enlisted in this movement between 70 and 80,000 in the United States. We will then compare the, the directories with who's registered. Then we will decide which of these voters we want to activate. We want to discourage the others from the same congregation, right? But on the face of it, what the parishioners see is, you're an American, go vote. We're gonna give you a voter guide that strongly suggests how to vote. Whoever was financing Brexit or whoever was financing Trump, they certainly want their pound of flesh at the end of it. People don't put millions, tens of millions into a campaign unless they think they're gonna get a return on their investment. I can say that for sure. The ultimate position to be in, um, in a state of war, is when your adversary has no idea that they're in a war. The stakes are that high, and in fact, 
these systems of civil society that we've worked so very, very hard to build, um, they can crumble and disappear. We continue to offer up our children as living sacrifices to the Malika government schools. A lot of effort's been wasted on school reform. Government schools are no more reformable than Soviet collective farms. This movement is attacking a lot of the institutions that taxpayers have formed to care for people, like the Affordable Care Act, like public education. And then when they are defunded and start to wobble, they say, see, they're failing. Come see our parallel universe, see our, our fundamentalist schools, see our so-called Christian collective health care entities. So they're trying to set up institutions that address all of these needs and make people dependent. On, yeah. on their entire superstructure. I, I feel that Americans have gotten lazy about democracy. They, they, you know, if people say, oh, why don't they do something? And I say, who do you think they is? Today on Family Talk, Jesus is Lord not just over the church. He's Lord over government and over the universe. We need to start acting like that. I have a map of the second floor of the Ritz-Carlton in New Orleans. This shows where all the different sessions of the Council for National Policy are going to be happening. There's a big Catholic mass. There's a board meeting at 4.30 to 5.30, and we have booked this Vermilion Room. My secret recorders are these. It's your cross, and it's an HD camera. It's got a little camera in it. You know, I'm gonna vote for people that's more in line with what this Bible said. The founders put in the impeachment clause just so if someone came in and they were the worst villain you ever saw in your life, you had a way to be able to rectify yeah. that. Well, they impeached Clinton no, yeah. and, and really nothing changed. I didn't agree with the way he was living his life, but does that make him not fit to be the president? See, I mean, me, it, it was I... a mistake back then. It's an even bigger mistake today. You know what I thought? Man, these Jesus, in the end, we're all sinners. Hello. Hey, baby, sure I missed you. Just calling you to tell you I'm in New Orleans. I am just uh, driving down Canal Street. There's a big police thing going on across the street from me, trying to get to my hotel. I am so sorry I'm not with you, darling. I am sorry you're not with me, too. I wasn't scared at first. I thought I was on a bit of an adventure. You know, it's like, okay, I'm gonna get my microphones, record undercover at the Council for National Policy, and, you know, be the first person who's ever done it. And it would be really exciting. And I, I wasn't scared about it at all. Um, but then I get there. And they say, well, you know, there's gonna be no ins or outs to the hotel. And I'm like, this is, this is the Ritz-Carlton in Canal Street. What do you mean no ins or outs to the hotel? Who shuts down Canal Street? The plan had been that I had booked one of the rooms for lunch, but then they canceled that. What in the world is going on in the hotel? Yeah, there's just security everywhere on the street shut down. They told us there were going to be no ends or outs between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. And I thought, fuck it, I'll book breakfast and just stay for a long time. I'm in the hotel. I can't even get out of the hotel if I want to. Um, so I'm going to wander around and shoot what I can. a blessing we received, and we now look forward to another six hours in which we will receive that which you would have us to know to be more effective missionaries and, and soldiers for you. Amen. Amen. And what we're going to do during this luncheon time is to provide expertise in how you can judge the best place to give your assets. Talk to me about what you saw. You know, I saw a lot of stuff. I saw a lot of business being done. That's one of the things that I 
came away from it with. It's like, man, there's a lot of money floating around, a lot of arrogance, a lot of power. Many of you, and we too on executive committee, have expressed a need to, for the conservative movement to be as organized, especially as we approach 2020. Today, we are offering you an entrepreneurial look at how you might become an activist on your own. So the election taught us it's broken up and the churches aren't networking. Could we apply what we know about media to that and float the idea to a policy organization in California, which we've done, and we will fund a division in there and they'll do nothing but try and network the churches. So this is super quick, right? We can do that fast. It is going up, yeah. It's a heavy film. Yeah. Yeah. Are we funding the past or are we funding the future? Talk with J.P. DeGantz, uh, who has Communio, who's, who's working on saving marriages and, and lowering divorce rates in key cities with a very innovative, um, almost franchise concept, where they take something that works in one city and replicates it in the other. And it's, it's pretty exciting. There are about 36 electoral votes to play with in the election. Donald Trump won Michigan by 12,000 votes. That's 16 electoral votes. Pennsylvania's 20, and Wisconsin's 10. The line in the middle you see is the line you cannot cross. My attorneys at both the state and the federal level spent an enormous amount of time. Think about it. We've identified key voters. We know they want to go our way. It's like what I do with pastors now with my C3. We can't give that to the campaign when they need it the most. So we got to figure out how to do that. Yeah. It's a lot of, a lot of fires you have to put out. <laughs> Some groups have to disclose the donors, others don't. What's dark money? This is the big phrase. But it's political spending that's meant to influence voters where money is not disclosed and sources are not known. C4 organizations, political nonprofits. That means they've got a purpose to what they're doing. They can't do political purpose things. They can't spend more than like 49.9%, but they can spend that IE money um, specifically for an organization or a candidate, and they can engage in those political activities as long as they're defined not to be the primary purpose of the organization. Then I finally made my way to the Vermilion Room. And then I get there, and there's all these secret service types. No, I'm trying to find the restaurant. Sorry. Thank you. And I thought, OK, who's here? What's this about? So we need to get people in our churches, our organizations, every group you have a sphere of influence with to do voter registration and make sure they're a part of that. We know that helps because once voter registration has been done, those names go into the state election records then that's accessible for the campaign, the candidate. They know who those people are. If you're not doing anything else, make sure you're helping to sponsor and run voter registration drives everywhere you possibly can. Keep this in mind as I wrap up. 36 electoral votes to play with. You've got to think about this for 2020. I saw a group of tourists getting ready to go, and I thought if I can just slide up behind them, and be a part of what they're doing, then I can slip out with them if they manage to get out. Pass security, pass the Secret Service, and then I was scared, yeah. It's like, am I gonna end up with a taser in my back or thrown in jail in Louisiana? Nobody wants to be thrown in jail in Louisiana. And then uh, pass the uh, friendly cop waiting outside. Hey, what happened? Vice President. Okay, thanks. Yep. How did you feel when you realized the vice president was going to come? Oh, uh, like I needed to get the hell out of there fast as I could. You know, like get the hell out right now. But in this very close race that took place, that allowed America to change course, it was made possible because of our speaker this morning, the 48th Vice President of the United States, ladies and gentlemen, Mike Pence. Hello, CNP. You are a sight for sore eyes. 
I bring greetings from President Donald Trump. Didn't he something? I'll tell you. You know, some people think he and I are a little bit different. Uh, but I'll tell you what, he and I have become very close friends. Uh, thank you for your enduring support. And frankly, the leadership in the council that the Council for National Policy advises and gives this administration every single day. Thanks for standing strong with this president and this administration. A young person asked me just the other day, they said, how do you deal with the socialist agenda? And I said, we talk about freedom. We tell freedom's story to this rising generation because it's not going to be enough for us just to win the next election. We've got to win the next generation for freedom. So CNP, in the face of their radical agenda and destructive politics, now more than ever, we've got to educate, we've got to communicate, and we've got to mobilize. We've got to run so as to win. In every day between now and Election Day, and if you're inclined to bow the head and bend the knee over the next year and a month, it'd be a good time to do it. What was your impression of this movement after having seen it on the inside? I come from a conservative family of churchgoers, um, but they're not trying to take people's rights away. Um, they're just conservatives. These people, they're not conservatives, they're radicals. Is the fear greater than the virus itself? President Trump and his administration, they've acted decisively, they've acted responsibly to respond to this virus, and they got ahead of it very early. It, it does appear that the administration is taking all of the right steps, the president, in my view. I am encouraging churches all over the country to participate in Reopen Church Sunday, the first Sunday in May, Reopen Church Sunday. You can go to reopenchurch.org. Donald Trump rose to power with the assistance of a movement that denies science, bashes government, and has prioritized loyalty over um, professional expertise. I want to go first to my, straight to my first guest. 48th Vice President of the United States, Vice President Mike Pence. Tony Perkins, it is good to be with you on Washington Watch. That has obviously contributed to our inability to address this crisis in an evidence-based fashion. Misinformation is rife in those hyper-conservative and hyper-partisan religious communities that we're all in for Trump. Now the projections are that we're going to, to, to see less than 100,000 uh, fatalities uh, as a result of this, uh, the virus. That's significantly lower than some projections. Is this the result of the, as you said, people uh, uh, heeding the guidance of the CDC and, and, and quite frankly, the prayers that have been lifted up? Progress that we're beginning to see is, we really believe is evidence that the American people understand that their future is in their hands. Ordinarily, the kinds of consequences of this type of behavior don't really show up for some time. In the case of a pandemic that's killing people, the consequences are too obvious to ignore. Churches have worked, I think, uh, very well with the administration. Mr. Vice President, I do appreciate uh, you joining us today. And I, and I would encourage you, I, I know the Justice Department is, is on this, but as, as evidence emerges that there may have been some that went too far, and singling out religious institutions, that uh, that's something that's addressed in the days ahead. Because while uh, we're all in this together, these fundamental freedoms must be defended and protected here at home because it does have implications for what we do abroad as well. In times of crisis, People and communities often turn to the church for guidance and support. In these times, how can churches rise up and find new ways to be a light in their community?
Considering the present climate and concerns around coronavirus, you can register your church in the Community Services Directory. You'll also have access to four customizable surveys that you can use to get a pulse on how your people are doing. Learn more and sign up for free today. The more that you should probably look for, it depends on how long you've got and how much time you've got and all the rest of it, which is the Russian connection. Um, is the camera rolling at the moment in terms of what's it? I'll do it when the camera's off on this one, actually, because that's, uh, that's one that will get you killed. Tarde o temprano Dios 